Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Everton show. It's the very last Everton show of the calendar year of 2017 and as we usher out the old year we're going to hear from somebody we haven't heard from for a very very long time. When we were in Cyprus recently for the Europa League game with Apple on Limassol we caught up with Mike Walker, the man who left Norwich City in January 1994 to take charge here at Goodison Park. Things didn't go as well as Mike Walker hoped but he was happy to sit down with the Everton show over in Nicosia. It was the right club, but at the wrong time, you know. Um, so, but at the end of the day, you know, I thought, well, I'll go there, and I was confident. I thought I could change it round. Um, obviously, subsequent events showed I couldn't, at least not quick enough, anyway. Um, and you have to accept that. Made but but it was low on confidence. We made a decent start, I remember. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, obviously, a new manager comes in, even even when the manager gets sat in the, and the caretaker takes over. They usually do well for three or four games. That sort of honeymoon period. And then it's whether they're either they're good enough or you're good enough to get your ideas over comes to fruition and you either do or you don't. I have to say, you look back and the team wasn't good enough. I mean, there was a few players getting older who had been good players, but were getting over the top. Um, I don't think I made them worse. I, don't, I think that, as you rightly said before, they weren't uh, full of confidence either. Um, but you, you, know, you think you can turn it around and uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Uh, we had some one or two good good results, and you think to yourself, "Yeah, it's coming," you know, but it, it just didn't it didn't sustain, and um, unfortunately, we didn't really have any money to buy any 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 players, you know, and subsequently, you're scratching around trying to get one or two. Um, I was a bit disillusioned in as much as I thought that the ambition was to get one or two better players, and there were one or two players who, even to this day, haven't surfaced that I went for. That. One wouldn't come because we were struggling, you know, with a bottom end, or two wouldn't come because we wouldn't pay the wages. Um, and as has been proven today, you don't get the players if you don't pay the wages. When we beat Oldham, I was looking this morning uh, in March, we were 14th in the table, and it was it was perhaps an opportunity to push on. But as you say, it just it just didn't happen. We went we went a million miles away, were we? No, it, there was. The, the, this is the thing that was. In, you know, obviously, when I went there, and I'm thinking, well, you know, this is a good position. You know, you you, you don't look as if you you, you don't look to say take them down you look to go upwards but as I said you know you look at the team they weren't particularly that confident um, and it was just I thought it was just a question of change, turning that round you know you think to yourself well let's, let's get it going and uh, but it when you try I did try to change a few things you know I was trying to get back to playing a bit more pure football if you want um, whether that's right or wrong but that's my philosophy and that's that's what I wanted to do um, and obviously as I said, maybe the players couldn't take it on board. Uh, maybe I wasn't uh, good enough at, at putting it over to them. But um, there was there were games where we did play, and you think, well, they're, they're getting it. So, and I don't see why they shouldn't have got it. The game everybody remembers is obviously the last game of the season against <laughs> Wimbledon. Yeah. That was that that is real pressure, isn't it? How did yeah. you sleep the night before, Mike? Or did um, you? Probably in fits and starts, I imagine. You know, I can't remember that well, but but certainly it was a big game and. You know, in terms of the wrong end of the table, but it was nevertheless it was a lot of pressure. You know, people talk about pressure at the top, but obviously you know that, and Everton not being a uh, possibility of them going down was unthinkable really. Um, but at half time we were down, as you well know. Um, with other results we were going that way, and then we had the obviously you know, you know some, you could say what you like about the team, but they fought back for that game and, and they came back and won. You know, and it wasn't so you know they say managers have lost the team, managers done that. It wasn't necessarily levelled at that time, but you think well. No, they were still doing it, you know, they were still believing to the end. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the atmosphere after was absolutely unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it in my life. The fans were magnificent, I mean, you know, so afterwards was, was unbelievable. Such a relief, you know. Um, and then you think, well, we can try and build on that for next season. Uh, the only thing I think about it is that it was so, so euphoric at that time. And you think, well, this is not right. You know, Everton shouldn't be celebrating staying up, you know. When we went 2-0 down, when Gary Ablacod, rest his soul, put through his own net, did a part of you think, we've gone here, we're not going to come back from this? Not, not really, but, you'd be, but you'd be, not, not that we'd gone, but you think, well, this is just, this is, sums up what's happened. Yeah. You know, the own goal, we, we're behind again, you know, and it's just, maybe it's in, written in the gods that we're not going to survive, you know. But then it's fleeting and you think, well, no, we've just got to keep going, you know, if we, if we keep doing what we're doing, maybe luck will favour us, and of course, in the end, it did. Nothing went right, though, did it, at the start of the following season? No, it didn't. Um, you know, people say, you know, as I said to you, somebody said, oh, shambles. I don't, it wasn't a shamble. You know, we were, trying to, we were still trying to change things, still trying to do things, and it just, it just didn't work out. You know, it was, you know I remember even when Duncan came, 
He's obviously still with the club. You know, I mean, he, he did everything but score. You know, I remember he hit the bar, goalkeeper's making great saves, blah, blah, blah. It was only a short period, but, but you, another time that had gone in. And after I'd got sacked, the next game, as you well know, yeah. um, what happens? David James, who's, who's an excellent goalkeeper, but known to make a few mistakes, comes out, misses the ball, straight on his head, goal. Now, you know, you could look back and you say, oh, if that had happened before, you know, maybe that would have been the confidence to turn everything around. But we'll never know, and uh, it wasn't, so... Was Everton Football Club a bigger club than you thought it would be, mate? It, it was, of course it was bigger. Yeah. But it wasn't any bigger than I expected it to be, you know. Um, I expect to... See, the, the difference as well, the fans were different, they're demanding. And, and I, that, but that's not a problem to a manager. Most managers will say, well, that's good, you know, it puts pressure on me, but it puts pressure on the players. Mm. That's how you react. And they're saying, I, I thought I reacted in a, in a good way, but it, unfortunately things didn't work out, you know, on the field. And obviously on the field is where it's important. Mm. And when it comes down to it, the manager takes the cat. It doesn't matter what happens. When you look back at your time at Everton, would you have done anything differently? Yeah, I've thought about this, uh, you know, over the years. Um, doesn't doesn't keep me up at night, but I often think, yeah, well, because you try, you, you think, well, it didn't go well, what could I have done better? And I, I think maybe I should have been a bit more hands-on myself, you know. You know, be, obviously, I'm, I'm going to get labelled for it, you know. 400 passes in your own half, all this sort of stuff, one or two have said, you know. Uh, not quite true, but the principle is right, yeah, and I go along with that. Not in my own half, hopefully. Guardiola does that, but they build it and go through. Now, that's what the intention was, that sort of thing. Didn't work out. So, yes, I would have said I, I, maybe I should have just put a bit more of my own input into it rather than let the coaches do it, you know. Um, not to say the coaches did what they want, so, you know, I'm not blaming them, but I'm saying, like, yes, I could have maybe put a bit more in. A bit more hands-on. And it might have been a bit, bit different. Looking at you, Mike, life in Cyprus clearly suits you down to the ground, but do you miss football? Yeah, I miss Yeah, I do. I mean, I've, I've gradually got away from it now as you get older, but um, I can't help looking at things and picking holes in it like everybody picks holes in, in me when I was there and everybody else. Um, but, yes, I do miss it. You know, I miss the involvement. You miss the, the banter in the dressing rooms. You miss the, the tactical workouts, you know, you have against other teams and the thrill of, of doing that and then beating somebody. Um, but then you don't miss the disappointment, you know, and, and the abuse you can get from different <laughs> things, as any manager will tell you. But that's all part and parcel of the game, you know. These, players, these managers get sacked, don't they? But the first thing they moan, but the first thing they do is try and get back in the game again. When you watch football now, you were saying before you get all the Premier League games over here. Do you watch it as a fan or are you still watching it as a coach? No, I watch it as a coach more than anything, I think. You know, I, I tend to watch the teams I, I like to watch, you know, the ones that want to play a bit. I, I can't be doing with the long ball stuff still. Um, you know, and and, uh, and I like to see the tactical, you know, changes that they make at half time and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just how I was, you know, and I, I just like to do that, you know. it's uh, And that's, you know, my career was short, really. And, uh, you know, I, I think I should have maybe gone back to England and, and carried on at some point, even with a lower league team, you know, if I wasn't good enough to take the big club, you know, I wasn't big enough. Um, but, it, but, you know, I decided to stay here. That was that's my decision. And um, so that's how it is. But, uh, no, still still in love with football, really. Sharpie, sometimes a manager and a football club seem to be a perfect fit, but it doesn't work out. No, it wasn't. It was, it was a difficult time for a at Everton Football Club came in in the back of a decent reputation at Norwich, you know, got them into European competitions and, and they took on some of the big boys, but a lot of hope and expectation when they joined the football club, but, you know, just unfortunately it didn't work out for them and, you know, listen, it came, we came narrowly close to, to the going down, so unfortunately I think that's what people remember Mike Walker for. People will always associate Mike Walker with that Wimbledon game here mm -hmm. at Goodison Park when the park stand wasn't even yeah. there. You were involved in the relegation battle as well, but elsewhere. I was. I was at, at Oldham under Joe Royal. Uh, I was injured at the time, and we travelled down to Norwich uh, for a game down there. And you know, I'd, I'd heard about all the things that, that happened on the Friday night of the game and the run up to the Wimbledon Everton game, and how it was a must-win game, obviously for Everton. Uh, and then I was getting little feeds coming through, saying that Everton had gone behind, and then the, the, the Barry Horn had scored, and Ann Seger's let one in, and all <laughs> sorts of things. So I said to Joe afterwards, I said, because all of them were involved as well, and I said, Everton were never, ever going to lose that game. They came close, but they're never, ever going to lose it. Everton Football Club, had we gone down at the time, it may well have been a long, long way back. Well, you just have to look at some of the teams, Dan, that you know that have been in the Premier League and gone down and, and struggled to get back up. You know, there's no guarantee that you're you're going to come up the first time of asking. So that's something. Listen, that we didn't want to even contemplate. You know, we came very, very close. 
uh, and hopefully that's the last we'll see of that. You know, this season uh, we started off slowly and, you know, that word was getting banded about, but in recent weeks the lads have responded well and, uh, and now it's looking upwards. That's just about it for part one of this week's Everton show here from Goodison Park. Coming up in part two, we'll hear from another old face, Archie Knox, remember him? And we'll also have another one of our fabulous pieces of Blue Crimbo films. Welcome back to part two. Time now to hear from another old face. We heard from Mike Walker, of course, in part one. Now we're about to hear from Archie Knox, the Scotsman who came down from Glasgow Rangers in 1998 as part of Walter Smith's backroom team. Archie was at Finch Farm last week and he sat down with me. You know, Sam coming in and a heap of experience, you know, he's been the course before, so he'll get the thing settled down and he uh, He'll build Everton up, up again, I'm, I'm no doubt about that. And, and Sammy with, Lee as well, you know. Sammy, you? worked with Sammy at Bolton and uh, uh, that was a great time as well for me. But um, And I'm sure the two of them will, will pick Everton up and make them a, a strength to be reckoned with again. You can't beat experience, can you? Bit of know-how on the training pitch. Well, that's, that's where it counts. You know, you can talk all you want, you can have all the analysis that you want, you can have... Uh, Whatever is attached, extra is attached to football as uh, before uh, when when I was involved, then all that is important and there's a place for it. But there's nothing to beat somebody that has the know-how mm -hmm. and how players work and how players react and stuff like that. And Sam and Sammy have definitely got that and Craig Shakespeare, of course, mm -hmm. as well. Do you enjoy seeing former players moving into coaching that you worked with, the, the likes of Duncan Ferguson and Franny Jeffers and, and even Danny Cadamartri? I bet you never thought Danny would go into coaching. No, and nor did I think Big Dunk either, you know, and it surprises you, the, the, the lads. You know, then, as you say, then John Eberl there, I see Dave Unsworth, you know, lads that have, uh, you know, came through the ranks and are now involved in the, the coaching setup, and it's great to see. You know, it's uh, a fantastic, and for them to get the opportunity, uh, starting off with young lads' teams, under 20s, or even younger lads than that, it's a tremendous experience for them. And uh, if they want to make their way in the game, then they've just got to work hard at it and see what opportunities arise for them and, and take these opportunities as they come along. Just getting back to yourself, I know you've spent some of your spare time writing your autobiography. At last... Well, it's a long story, that one, but eventually uh, I did it. And um, it's it's like everything else. I was never going to do uh, a book where there would be a, uh, stories that you would uh, not allow to tell, if you like. <laughs> and uh, no, so a lot of the lads gave uh, their opinions of me and stories about me and stuff like that. And I did the same with some of the players and managers and that I worked with. So... It's uh, it's a good laugh. Some of the some of the stories that are in there. You've done well to get your whole football career in one book, really, haven't you? You could have done two or three. I probably could have done a book for each club. It was that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you wanted to tell all the stories, but no, no, that's enough for me. Uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. How's Walter? Walter's fine. Yeah, I'm uh, hopefully meeting him and a few of the troops next week sometime for a a Christmas day out or. Nowadays, it's not so much a Christmas day out as just a Christmas afternoon out or something like that. <laughs> so, if Alan well, Coist is involved, there's probably plenty. Yes, of and there'll be plenty of stories there as well. You're still in love with football, aren't you? Aye, aye, great. It's fantastic coming in here, you know, and seeing, uh, as, as I say, uh, some of the players that, uh, what do you call it, are there now and some of the old faces that are back working the coaching and uh, I thoroughly enjoy that. There's nothing... There's nothing like football. There'll be never anything in my life that'll be able to mm. replace football. You know, then I know you've got grandkids, and it's uh, difficult to say these things when you've got four grandkids and stuff. But football was the love of your life, and um, you know, then uh, I still I still take a great thrill from going to games and watching games. They don't make him like Archie Knox <laughs> anymore, Graham, do they? They certainly don't. Talk about old school. Uh, <laughs> Archie was old school. I, I came across him first when. We was involved in the Scotland setup, uh, Alec Ferguson and, and Walter uh, Smith there as well. But he was hard, you know. He, he wanted you to to give a hundred percent, not just in the training, not just on the pitch, sorry, but in training as well. You know, he was he was old school, uh, and he wanted you to 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 go through a brick wall for for him and Walter. And listen, everybody 
who played under him has got a good word to say about him, mm. you know. And listen, he had some characters to deal with, not just here but at Rangers as well. We talk about Gaza and having to deal with him on a day to day basis, you know, it, it, he was a handful. But no, Archie was was strong, very, very strong. And I thought the two of them, I thought Archie and Walter uh, were a were a good match, you know, and I think uh, obviously the success they had at Rangers just couldn't replicate that down here. Uh and it was a difficult time for the football club as well, so it, was, it wasn't an easy time to take over. But certainly, there's some memorable memorable games in there. But uh, you know, Archie Archie was good at his job. Archie's a, a gentleman, a really nice guy. But oh. I saw him issue a few rollickings, and I would not like to be on the wrong end of one. Well, it wasn't because he had standards then, and he had standards, you know, on and off the field, and you, you had to respect it, and you had to respect him. Uh, and when you were on that training field. You had to listen and learn. It's as simple as that. He, he didn't like MD slacking. He wanted it a hundred percent. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think if you ask any of the of, of, of the, the the players who played under him and at that era, that's what he had to do. You know, and, and and it was hard at times. Could he could he do it nowadays? I'm not so sure. No, no. <laughs> Those the answer then. Okay, but no, I don't. Th- I think that football's changed. We all know that, and and the treatment of players has changed. Whereas in those days, you know, you could give a a rollicking out in the dressing room and you know get a response nowadays I'm not sure if it works like that but certainly Archie uh, has a fantastic career How big was Archie on team spirit Graham? because as you say he had some big characters at Rangers mm-hmm. big characters here big characters at Man United and big characters at Scotland as well He did and listen he watched you hard in the training ground but he knew you had to have downtime as well and I think if you look at the, the Rangers team in particular that, that him and Walter had team spirit was a big big thing and it was a bit bonding off the pitch as well so he was a big one for that but listen that didn't mean that if you were in the next day you had to train 100% mm. so he let you have a little bit of leeway but he knew in return you had to show him the respect as well and he, and he certainly got that from all the players he dealt with Always great to see Archie Knox back at Finch Farm Right I'm sure you remember George Shaw the young boy with cerebral palsy who once scored an Everton goal of the month here at Goodison Park well we've been in touch with George recently and he brought his cerebral palsy team down to USM Finch Farm for some training So basically, I got, um, I've been awarded this pass by Sam Allardyce, um, the new Everton manager, and he signed it for me. Yeah. Words can't describe it. Um, just playing alongside Aaron, Seamus, and Jags. It's absolutely being able to d- skin Aaron Lennon and put it in. <laughs> that's brilliant too. But um, it's just it's being in this whole surroundings, brilliant really. And I think the team really enjoyed it. And. I think I was a bit starstruck when everyone kept walking. I was trying to play footy, but then Funes walked in, Davy, and everyone's brilliant, yeah. He's, he's unbelievable. Um, like I said, even for us, he's, he's an inspiration. Um, and um, like I said, it's been great. Um, you can see how much everyone's enjoyed it, even us. <laughs> As the older lads, we can't wait to join in, and it's been great fun. But nah, he's, he's a top lad, he is, and he's, um, he's an inspiration, definitely. It's nice to share, to, to, to share the Christmas cheer. Um, obviously, with George bringing his mates down today, it's quite an easy one for us. We took a jump on and have a little run around with the kids, and they've all you know thrown out high fives, all having a good time. Most of us got a bit of a, a, bit of a sweat having a few red faces, but you know it's what it's, what it's all about. Um, obviously, George is close to our hearts with uh, you know uh, not only the condition he's got and how he gets on with things, but he's obviously uh, one of us. He's won the goal of the month. Uh, two years ago and stuff like that, so he's uh, he's one of the lads, and um, I say he's enjoying himself today. Yeah, very proud of all of them. Um, George is a little character; he's not one you forget. But I'm so lucky because I get to work with him every week, and and we've got hundreds of George. Well, there's about 90 odd Georges, um, but obviously George is he's, he's got um, a gift, and and he's so sociable and empathetic, and he's great, and he is a good ambassador for the club, and like I said, for CP football. I think it's great to, to they can see the pros and, and the amount of time the pros have spent with the lads. Um, it gives them an extra push and I think they'll remember it for the rest of their lives. What was the first thought that came into your mind when you, you were appointed as the Anderson manager? Wow. Wow, wow, brilliant. Um, a, ma- a massive football club and um, lots of my friends um, played Everton, like Peter Reid and Paul Bracewell, uh, Seamus McDonough, Mickey Walsh, like you mean. Andy Gray and so they all told me how great Everton Football Club was and obviously 
uh, playing against Everton over the years at all the clubs I've managed and the crowd and Goodison, fantastic. How well do you think you're going to do it all for uh, Everton Football Club? Well, well, my aim this season would to be get, get back in the top half of the table if we could now. Two fantastic wins back to back, glad to have responded well. Get all the injuries fit and uh, hopefully we can finish in the top half of the table. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Lovely piece of film that Sharpie and a lovely way to end the calendar year. Yeah, it's great. Everybody's really, really fond of uh, the young man and he's had a big impact on people. But that's some of the things we do at the football club. You know, we're very, very proud of what we do and, uh, and hopefully that'll be the case for many years to come. Lovely way to wrap 2017. And that's just about it for this week's Everton show. In fact, that's just about it for this year. Thank you very much indeed for watching right throughout the year from myself and Sharpie and everybody associated with the Everton show. A very happy new year. You've been watching The Everton Show on YouTube. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sure you have. Don't forget to subscribe, and that way you can catch every single future episode.